G'day guys, welcome to Guitar Wank Podcast. This is the debut show, the first one out of the gate. We hope uh, it goes well. If it doesn't, I guess it'll be the first and last show. But we're going to have fun with it, we're going to enjoy it, and hopefully we're going to do a lot of these shows and just uh, have a great time and talk about some great different things, all to do with guitar, music, and just whatever comes across the table. I'm here with my two stars, Mr. Bruce Foreman and Scott Henderson. Guys, thank you for turning up and uh, and doing this. This is fantastic. My name's Troy McCubbin. I'll be chatting with these blokes and having a good time with it. Um, yeah, this is this is it. So we're going to get into it. But a little backstory on the whole show and how this come about. Uh, let's rewind back to Australia Mm, early 90s I'm, I'm doing guitar lessons with my teacher in Australia and his name is uh, Tony Calabro a great guitar teacher giving me a great foundation in, in jazz and classical and, you know I'm getting the works and great stuff from him and he says to me I remember the, the guitar lesson it was a Wednesday afternoon he hands me a cassette and he says Troy you need to listen to these guys you need to know these players uh, listen to them buy their material and you know he was really pushing this stuff so my ears could get you know and, and know what what's great guitar playing um so he gives me this cassette and it's got people like joe pass and tel farlo uh, pat martino uh, herb Ellis, and you know all these amazing great players on there and then there's another guitar player on there who's playing all this amazing bebop bebop stuff and really edgy and a bit of attitude in his playing really fast um and i was it reminded me of like charlie parker on guitar and i was really into charlie parker at the time i just sort of discovered him and i was like wow this stuff's amazing how do these guys do it so i find out who this guitar player is um because i connected with his style so much and it was bruce foreman so i quickly become a fan of bruce foreman uh, fast forward to, I think, 97, I arrive in Los Angeles to go to Musicians Institute. I went there for a little bit and I got to, you know, have a, have lessons with Scott Henderson, uh, who's another favorite player of mine. Fantastic stuff. I got to play some of my best music with Scott in lessons and stuff like that. Um, then fast forward to two years ago. I'm at a gig invited by a friend and the guitarist in the band is Bruce Foreman. I had no idea watching this guy who he was. I just knew this guy was amazing. And then when the singer introduced him, it was Bruce Foreman. I, you know, I fell off my chair. I was like, oh my God, (laughs) how ironic. So we quickly became friends and we've been hanging out and uh, it's been fantastic. And Bruce was kind enough to invite me to breakfast one morning with one of his good friends he said you got to come to breakfast me and a mate get together all the time we have the breakfast and i'm like okay who's who's your mate he's like scott henderson I'm like no way and it just seemed like a really odd couple of guys to get together you know bruce foreman scott henderson it's like really you guys are really best mates he's like yeah we've, we've been mates for ages we have a great time come along have breakfast with us it'll be great so I go and have breakfast with the guys at a place called Cindy's in um, like Eagle Rock. And we just, it was just fantastic. I just had such a ball listening to these guys and, and picking their brains and asking questions and hearing stories. And, and I come out of that breakfast thinking, wow, you know, I wish I could, sh- I want to share this. This was just so much fun. And it was cool. These guys have got so much experience, playing experience, and they're so talented at what they do in each different fields that they're in. They're very different players. And it was just fantastic. And I was thinking about it. I'm like, man, we should do a podcast. And I mentioned it to Bruce and he was like, yeah, why not? And that's how Guitar Wank kind of come about. You know, I, I walked away from that breakfast sort of laughing so much because these guys are just hilarious to talk with. But I had that image of the, you know, the two old guys on the Muppets in the balcony. Uh, They kind of reminded me of those guys as guitar players. And it was just, I just laughed a lot and it was a lot of fun and really informative and it inspired me. And I thought, you know what, we need to share this. So I've talked to these guys into doing this and hopefully they won't regret it. So um, yeah, by all means, send in 
your your comments give us some feedback because uh we'd love to hear from you go to guitarwank.com uh we've hit all the social media you know it all you know youtube and facebook and twitter all the crap that's out there we're on it we're out there so you guys can find us easily um come and check us out give us some feedback and uh we're just gonna have some fun just talking back and forth about different things and i know i have a ton of questions for these guys and i'm sure you guys do too so uh send them in and we'll get rolling scott bruce thank you guys for doing this this is really really awesome it's such a pleasure to uh to sit down and chat with you guys how did you guys meet like how did it seemed like the odd couple to be hanging out with each other and be, be <laughs> friends. I mean, is there some kind of well, thing? Why? Because I'm a transvestite guys... and he's straight. Yeah, you know. <laughs> he, was che- to announce. he was the cheapest guy on the corner that day. <laughs> <laughs> I met Bruce at, at school, I think, was the first was time. Was it at MI? Yeah, because you came and you, you did an open counseling. Right. And I came in the room and just said, "Hey, man, let's play. Let's let's play some tunes." And we ended up playing together, right? And just hanging out, and that's the first time we met. I'm pretty sure. That yeah. Was, yeah, and we Did played. You... Yeah, yeah, that was right. I mean, I thought yeah. we'd met before that, but maybe not. I knew who you were because I yeah. saw you when I was parking my car. I says, "Boy, that that guy looks for me." Oh, yeah, that's Scott. You know, so I remember seeing you outside somewhere. And yeah, then we played, and that was sure burning, man. He swings his ass off, and it was great. We had a lot of fun. And then we hung out a bunch at the Pisano Guitar Nights. We played right, those. Right, And then I started to come hear Cowbop, because he had been sending out you know, those group emails where he always advertises his gigs. Right. Half the time I'm out of town on a tour... Or, you know, I've got a daughter. I don't leave home that much. You know, I'm not like, I don't really go out to the clubs that much. I'm yep. pretty hard to get me out of the house. But I really did want to see that. So from the first time I saw Calbop, I was like, this is fun. I will. This is something that I would definitely want to go see again. And I've been numerous times to see the, the, the band and also to hear Bruce play with his trio with right. Smitty Smith and the bass player, or I guess ex bass player from Cowbop. What's his name? Yeah, Alex Frank. Alex, yeah, right? Yeah. He, th- which is he's Josh's cousin, right? Right. Josh, Josh Smith's Smith, cousin. Great guitar great player. Great bass player yeah, and yeah. great guitar player. But yeah, so that's that's kind of how we got going, and and then every once once in a while we have a breakfast over at Cindy's, Cindy's which is yeah. right over by my house. Yeah. And we just like to talk shit about music and just about what's going on. And now, did you yeah. guys know? You, you knew all of each other before that. Absolutely. Obviously. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. oh man. Sure, I mean, I've, yeah. I know. Yeah. And I've had a, Scott's Tribal Tech records. And, you know, I'd heard him play. And and I'd seen some of his great teaching videos. There's one particular one where 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 Freddie gets laid, I think it was. Matt, yeah. <laughs> Something about Ed having sex Ed, with Eddie, his girlfriend. Eddie. Eddie has sex with his girlfriend. That's yeah. what it was. It was it was really one of the classic moments in guitar video history. <laughs> and uh, I still channel that oftentimes when I what play. What was what was the first videos you did? Was it was it Starlink? Or? No, I just did two videos for R E H that were oh, that okay. were remember them? Yeah, Roger yeah. and Don Mock. Yeah. And uh yeah, one one video was real simple, just on tools for improvisation, scales and arpeggios and whatever you chord tones, whatever you need to play over changes. And the second one he was talking about was a phrasing video, just how to how to make good phrases and continue melodic ideas. You know right. what I mean? Build melodic statements and stuff like that. Play yeah. motifically. And that's what that video was about. And they combined the two videos and made a DVD out of it, which is only 25 bucks, which is great. You know, so it's cheap. And anybody that wants to learn that stuff can afford 25 bucks. Yeah. Cause, right. I'm, cause sure, I, I'm sure Eddie's watching it right yeah, now. Yeah. Because I do more expensive <laughs> lessons off my website that are much more advanced. And those are like 75 bucks. But you got to kind of be advanced to get that stuff for right. the, the DVDs mainly for the beginner guys that just are starting out and need to know the first things you need to know about that. Right. Now, wh- where did you grow up? Like, where do you, where do you, West Palm you? Beach, West Palm Beach. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just played in clubs down there. And, and no, but how did you start guitar? <clears throat> was it the family member? What was, what was no, the it was Led Zeppelin on the radio. Believe it or not. AM radio was playing whole lot of love. That's how far, 
I should say that's how bad it is now because you'd never hear anything that great on AM radio now. Right. You know, but yeah, they were actually playing a whole lot of love with the middle section and everything on AM radio. And I heard it in the backyard. Uh, they were actually, my mom and dad actually got to the, the place where they could afford a pool. <laughs> and the pool guys were over there building a pool in our backyard. Right. And there was Led Zeppelin on the radio. And as soon as I heard that solo, I said, that's what I want to do. Really? It was that yeah. you found. Like you were it just was, like. That was it for me. That what was age? Like, that's this... what I was going to do. Maybe 12, 11. Wow. Yeah. Did you know like, any guys? Do you have any friends that were. Had some friends that were. Yeah, they they had listened to that music, and, they, and then I had another friend who was really into Deep Purple. He turned me on to Deep Purple, and that right. was like, oh my god, <laughs> that's what I want to do. Yeah, <laughs> and that was and that was it. Was it a yeah? Did it become an addiction? And yeah, was that, it became an obsession right. right from the very beginning. Yeah. So you how know, many how many hours a day were you on, living on the instrument? Every hour of the really? day. I yeah. mean, yeah. What where can I get this? What gear does he use? Where can I get it? <laughs> How much does it cost? Can I afford it? <laughs> was it yeah. was it like everything else in your life suffered because you were so No, I didn't have a life. <laughs> it Who has a life at eleven years old? So you start you really started then. Did you get lessons? How did the, how did you start off? Yeah, I got that? lessons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I found a guy, a local guy that would teach me things, you know, here and there. Not for much money either. It was like five bucks. Right. You know. And he didn't know that much more than me, but he knew enough to teach me. That's a lesson for all teachers. You only have to know a little bit more than your students to be a teacher. <laughs> I, I did that a long time. <laughs> yeah, so, so yeah, that, that was it. And that was it. And at what point did you realize, damn, I'm really good at this? Like, was, I still haven't realized that. <laughs> there wasn't a point where you were like, oh I'm, oh, I'm better than... A lot of players I see. I'm better than like anybody in my house. I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> my I'm dog is pretty good, dogs. though. I'm not even so sure about I'm that. I'm better than Buster. I don't know about Ruby. <laughs> yeah, well, keep your eye on the Australian Shepherd. They're dangerous. Man. I've heard that. Those are the dogs on the album. <laughs> yeah. oh, what, Bruce, what about you? What was, what was the thing with you? Well, you know, I don't know. It just sort of happened to me. Uh, I, I played classical piano as a kid from six years old. <laughs> Till, and then uh, about 12 or 13, a couple friends of mine had a guitar, and they showed me some chords, and it seemed pretty easy to do that, although. Um, and it was easy to carry it around. Right. And the music that w was played seemed to be more interesting to my peers. It was more of a social thing mm -hmm. than the, just the so playing piano. And uh, so I got a guitar... And eventually quit the piano and just was playing the guitar and just kind of doing anything anybody happened to be playing around me. You know, whether it was Beatles songs or Dylan songs or Birds or right. Bossa Nova or Blues, whatever. And then I heard Charlie Parker at about 14. Wow. And that just like, I couldn't believe anything was that great. And so uh, I went out and... I, you know, I'm a good Jewish boy, got, got a good education, and we, we do things, you know, if you want to know something, you get a book, right? Right. And so I went out and got a book about playing jazz on the guitar, or playing jazz at all. It wasn't a guitar book. And uh, I did what the book said for about an hour, and it, I sure didn't sound very good after that. And uh, so I got the record and started taking what was on the record off the record. Right. And, like, right away I was sounding better. So I kind of developed this sort of book bad record good mentality you know kids you know when you're a kid right. you, you want black and white you know it's like nothing's gray i just started pulling shit off records and found people who played good and tried to play with them and i did lessons with guys if they played good you know just to learn what they have them show me their shit you know right. what i mean and hang out with the guys and play and, and here i am today it's really that that a straight That's line simple. A straight line, really yeah. it is. You know, and I mean, always, I feel like Mr. Magoo, because I was in San Francisco at that time. We're yeah. talking 1969, 1970, San Francisco. You cool. know what was happening musically there then. Yeah, everything. And, and I'm into bebop jazz. <laughs> it's like the world of rock and roll is exploding around me. It's just like Mr. Magoo. Like buildings are falling down and shit around while I'm walking down the street and I'm not even noticing it, you know, because right. I'm deep off into other things. And I, I did hang out occasionally with with some of the guys from like the air at the airplane house there would be jams and stuff you know mostly the guys that wanted to hang out with them not really the ones in the band but 
some of their kids and some people that knew them. You know, there were great hangs there. Yes. But everybody was just sort of like playing a couple sounds and then turning knobs on their amp. And they had the best shit, I mean, the, to smoke. You know, they were by far, the, for, that, for that kind of a hang, that was the best place to be. <laughs> right. but, but for playing music, I was like, oh, no, can we play something finally? You know, like, I'm a, you know, it's like to them, they thought we were. And to me, it didn't seem like it. So right. I was just off with the jazz cats and being some little stupid punk prick snob, you know. <laughs> <laughs> again, went again went jazz good, rock bad, which is the stupidest thing I could have ever fucking done, and I hate myself for it for wasting a good amount of years there when so much great shit was happening around me, and I was just totally into one thing. Right, know. but yeah. it was a great thing that I yeah. was into, so that's were, what happened. Were you the same, Scott? Like no, learning? well, yeah, but but the thing is, is you know, music in the states is not about music it's too social it's about clicks yeah. and it's about lifestyle yeah. you know if you're around a bunch of guys listening to Deep Purple and someone else wants to listen to Aretha Franklin <laughs> then <laughs> right. they're an outcast right. Right. you know what I mean yeah. so it's like you know unfortunately you know that's one of my biggest uh, beefs is people that are closed minded and, and I learned it early on that you can't be and grow you know, right. so what I what what got me out of that was because I was in the world just like he was in the world of jazz. I was in the world of rock and roll, and all I listened to was Deep Purple and Led Zeppelin, maybe some Jeff Beck and some Hendrix, and that was it. That was my world, was totally one dimensional, right? And then I got an offer to play in this band, all black group, uh, like ten guys, horn section, playing nothing but James Brown, Cool in the Gang, Tower Power. All that stuff, you know, all that great music. And at first, I had, it, I, I was like out in outer space. I had no idea what to think of it all, right? I couldn't even understand what those guys were saying half the time. You know what I mean? Because I was right. a little white boy. I didn't understand any in, that language, right? Yeah, yeah. But I grew to love that music. And, and for four or five years, I played in that band. And it taught me that you can have a love for two completely different kinds of music and, and love them both the same. Right. And that got me into listening to jazz. I, I through Tower of Power, I think I heard some of those horn solos and went, "Whoa, what, what the hell is that? You know, what are those notes?" And those got me, you know, listening to to, to more fusion bands. Like you know, Chick Corea was starting a band, John McLaughlin was starting a band, Larry Coryell, and uh, Weather Report started listening to Weather Report. Then through them started hearing stuff like well they didn't invent that music those guys came from straight ahead jazz and i was like what the hell is that <laughs> so so i went backwards in time and started listening to charlie parker and john coltrane and i spent at least 10 15 years of my life totally immersed right. in bebop that's all i wanted to hear you know yeah. sort of left my roots behind for a long time because i was so interested in straight ahead jazz and i and, and learned how to play it you know not as well as he does, <laughs> but still, you know, I wasn't, didn't start playing it when I was 11. Right. You know, I started more playing straight ahead jazz when I was around 22 or 23. And uh, That's still really young. It is pretty young, yeah. yeah. But that's when I started hearing it and started getting interested in it. Yeah. And by 25, I guess I could manage in a kind of crappy way to play through standards. Right. You know, by the time I was 30, I was a lot better at it. But yeah, so I kind of went backwards in time, listening to music that inspired the music first. Right. In the same way as blues, it's like I. It took me a long time to learn that 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 Led Zeppelin didn't invent the blues, that Muddy Waters did, and that's where their inspiration came from. So I spent a lot of years listening to those old blues cats, you know, right. Robert Johnson and Muddy Waters and Albert King and BB King and all the Kings and all the people that inspired the white boys. To copy them, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I'm back. I'm turning around backwards chronologically. <laughs> right. So you went back and filled yeah. in all the holes. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's what everybody does. You know, I mean, I I had a similar experience. I got this gig with this organ trio. You know, and this guy was so amazingly versed. He was a church organ, basically. That's where his first things were. But he played great jazz and bop. But he also played funk like Tower Power. You know, and and played Latin. I mean, he was in so like to play with him. He was just like demanding all these things of me, and I had to like. And, and he was another guy who spoke in a language that I could barely understand. Same right. kind of thing. Yeah. And I just 
learn the shit as I went. And I was lucky to be in San Francisco because there was a salsa scene and I would play with Latin bands and learn how to do montunos and play the piano parts and stuff. You know, I played with some blues bands. So I kind of backfilled everything. Once I got into what I got into, it was, you know, you music has just got so much great stuff happening. Sometimes you learn it for the gig. Sometimes you learn it because it just falls on your head and you just realize how wonderful it is. Yeah. Sometimes somebody you know who you respect tells you about something that you might not have given it proper consideration, but you respect that person so much that you give it a second listen and you realize how you missed an important thing. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, you know, you, you are what you listen to, basically. <laughs> you know, so when you're in a situation where, you know, as you're growing up and all these things just come your way, it's just kind of luck, dumb luck sometimes that you find something that you're never going to hear on mainstream TV or radio. It's just that your friend turned you on to it and all of a sudden, holy shit, here's something I never heard of. And if it wasn't for this guy, I never would have heard it. Because right. you're not going to hear it on the radio, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, and that's what's wrong with society, basically in music, is that they're stuck to their radios. You know, they they only hear what's on the radio. They don't have like f musician friends telling them, "Hey, dude, check this out. Check this out. Check this out." You know, otherwise they'd be a lot more open-minded. Yeah, and there yeah. would be a lot more eclectic music in the mainstream for people to hear, like there is in Europe. You know, right. like you go over there and. You can hear Charlie Parker on the radio. I heard Charlie Parker McDonald's on this last tour. <laughs> you know, wow. in a McDonald's. I'm hearing Charlie Parker. That's never going to happen in the United States. We wanted to take this little break just to remind you that you're special. We love you. We need you. And uh, you've been listening to Guitar Wank Podcast with Bruce Foreman, Scott Henderson, and I'm Troy McCubbin, the guy who speaks a little funny. What the hell are you doing at a McDonald's in Europe? Well, because I wanted a Big Mac. I was tired of pork tongue and and bull's balls oh, you, and everything where, where, they serve where, where, where in were Austria. Oh, oh, I was in oh, Austria okay, okay. and I was tired of Austrian food and I wanted to eat a, a Big Mac. Okay. <laughs> I wanted a motherfucking McDonald's. <laughs> Wait, where was this at? Somewhere in Austria on the right. road. On one of those road stops, you know, where, where you know, you stop at a Rosenberger, which yeah. actually they're really good. You yeah. know, they eat great yeah. food, but I just had had enough of Rosenberger <laughs> and I wanted something <laughs> different. Now, what, I used to go see you at the, um, what was the place on, it was on Venture Boulevard and... Oh, Lavalier. Lavalier, The place that yeah. closed, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think I saw one of the last gigs you did there or something. Yeah. And just, I mean, I was just blown away. And then someone said, oh, you should check out his blues album. And I got that and seriously just floored me how amazing you are when you play the blues as oh, well. Oh, thanks. I thanks. was just like... Well, ah. I grew up kind of playing that. And one of the things that was kind of weird is that by the time... I managed to get a record deal. I was already in Tribal Tech, right. which was a completely, you know, like intellectual, you know, uh, fusion band, right? Yeah. Pretty far away from blues. So I never got to document the music that I grew up playing, you know. And after a couple records, or after actually six or seven records with Tribal Tech, I was going, wait a minute, um, this is not really the only thing I do, I should, I'm a blues player, you know, I should make a blues record. Right. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, he did the, start doing the blues thing kind of on the side. Yeah. And now that Tribal Tech's gone, I just sort of figure I'm doing everything now. Just right. playing a, a, a mixture of blues, jazz, rock, whatever just hits me at the moment. There's no rules. No. And that's one thing that's great about being fortunate enough to be on some of these record labels that trust me enough to know that I'm not going to go in the studio and just bang pots and pans around. They trust me and they know that they're not going to be able to classify what I do, but they don't care. Right. Because there, I remember days when your records had to have a, a, a certain kind of theme as far as stylistic theme to them you know you couldn't go far away from what you were doing on one song on another song and my records are all over the map right. there's a country tune there's a blues tune there's a straight ahead jazz tune you don't never know what you're going to hear do you think definitely i feel that the music industry now is definitely more open to that 
across the board. Like you. Can. I hope. Well, yeah. I, I don't know. I think you hit on one of the great things and horrible things about being older. You know, is like, uh, you know, you're you. I mean, we spend our, our young lives saying, I got to be me. I got to be me. I got to be me. And then one day you realize it's like, holy shit, I'm me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, fuck, I'm me. You know what I mean? Right. That's like the, like the, the awareness. And, right. and you realize you, you are honestly a conglomeration of things. Nobody, you know, and you realize that the word genre was created by somebody who wanted to sell the music, who wanted to put you in a box mm -hmm. so they could sell your shit. Yeah. And none of us, nobody who's really got any integrity, creative integrity, is like that. And so you get to this point where you just want to do what you're hearing. I mean, all of us, that's our, if we're creative, that's our goal is to get the sound in our, our sound in ourselves out to the world, yeah. you know, to communicate that. And it's always a conglomeration of things. And, you know, the world doesn't want that. The world wants to be able to put it in a nice little shiny box and sell it to a bunch of people who don't know the fucking difference. Mm -hmm. You know, and I mean, so we're, there's all this pressure on us to kind of almost define ourselves by genre. And the more we do that, the more we become not our true best self. You yeah. know, and, and someone like Scott, who is, they, people know, they get a Scott Henderson record, they're going to get Scott Henderson's plan. That's what they signed up for. Yeah. And the problem with that is his, his music is going to be forced to be stuck into a little bin that's going to keep it away from all the people who probably will love Scott Henderson's playing. Because they're never going to be exposed to it because it can't get stuck in a bin of yeah. kind of music that they think they like. Yeah, the media has kind of really become the enemy, uh, honestly, you know, at least in this country. It's not so much like that in Europe, but in the States, you know, the reason why all the jazz musicians are touring in Europe and South America and in and, and, and Asia is because there's no work here. Yeah. You know, I mean, my my last American tour was New York City, Chicago, Detroit, Austin, L.A. And that was it, like five gigs. Wow. And that's my American tour. I think Schofield's last American tour was L.A., New York. <laughs> that was it. Oh, isn't jazz so well, they, could, they could come with me on Route 66. Well, I could get them lots of gigs right, out there. You know, it's just, it's hard in the States. You know, yeah. it's hard. There's just not enough people to fill the room to, to pay for the cost of getting there. Yeah. So, so it's difficult. Well, but okay, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, yes, I agree with that. Of course, that's the reality. But there's also just like it's become this e economic engine, and we, we're presenting this music that's so difficult economically to, to produce. And the world is, is, there's so many pressures out there that the ability to just take it to a bunch of people that really would be receptive and to get to them, it's just become restrictive. Yeah, it's like there's so much bullshit in the way. Yeah, you know, what yeah. I mean, it's like, come on, there's a million people that would want to hear him, and maybe thirty that would want to hear me. But, <laughs> <laughs> but still, I can find those thirty fine. people. Okay, no, you mean twenty five? <laughs> so you know, um, but to get to them. You know, and get through all the noise to get to those people who would dig it, you know. And we really just want to play, but, you know, then we got clubs and the money. People, this guy's got to make money. We got to pay a hotel room. You know, it's like all this pressure on it. And so it's forcing us to think in these terms that we're not used to thinking. Mm. And, and of course, the world, let's face it, the media wants everybody watching at home watching TV because that's the way they sell them shit now. Yeah, yeah. So you, there is no, nothing good that's going to happen. If you go out to a nightclub, to the real people that run the world, yeah, you know you're not watching the TV, so you're not going to buy anything that's on that TV. You're not, you know, you're not, you're not going to stay home and you know, do the things that you know that that the, that they do, and then they put these sensational things and they scare you into thinking the whole world's dangerous. And that's their point. Why? Because if you're out there just hanging with everybody else, you're going to find out how cool it is and you're going to run into new stuff you didn't even know existed. And, and everyone's And, everyone's and you like might, you might, you might not be. Well, that's one of my calling right. bullshit things too. But, yeah. Um, you know, yeah. I mean, you were, you're not, you're no longer on the grid. Yeah. When you're at one of my gigs or one of Scott's gigs, you're off the grid now. Way off the grid. <laughs> and, and, you're and, like a million miles off the grid. <laughs> but the thing is, is that's where the humanity happens. Yeah. And there's a million great players out there, and there's a million mediocre players out there, a lot more mediocre, and a lot of shitty ones out there. But they still, there's a scene happening. Yeah. I mean, I've had good time 
around not great music. A lot of cool people hanging out, a great scene. Had a lot of fun, lot of fun playing with them. You know, yeah. it's like, what, where's this life shit? You know, we're looking at a box and everybody's programming it for us. Yeah. One thing is, one thing is that, that, that I have to realize that, and I think Bruce will probably agree, that it, the music that we, that we play, it is more challenging to listen to than what's on the radio, of course. You know, there's more chord changes, there's more, there's more harmony going on. Maybe the notes are a little bit crazier. And, and it is, for some people, a challenging listen, you know. And I understand that it's, an, it's, it's not only an acquired taste... But it's a growing kind of thing that you have to do to be able to appreciate it. You know, just like if I went to an art gallery, because I know nothing about art, and if someone said, you know, here's a picture and here's a picture, and I and it picked the best one, and I found out that one was painted by a three-year-old who had no idea what he was doing, and one was painted <laughs> by the most respective artist in New York, you know, I might pick the three-year-old. I don't know anything about art, right. you know, and I realize that a lot of people don't know anything about music they don't understand harmony like we understand it they don't know they haven't been taught music mm. but at the same time if they're exposed to it they can learn to like it and they can learn to love it yeah. you know even if they have nothing no music in their background whatsoever and the problem is they don't get exposed to it because yeah. there's nothing on the radio there's nothing on tv there and that's what I see the big difference between like playing an American audience and playing a European audience. When you play for an American audience, there's usually just musicians there. Right. But when you're playing at a European gig, there's people there, not just musicians. There may be half of them are musicians, but the other half are just people that like eclectic music. You know what I mean? They're not so closed minded. If it's not Beyonce, I'm not going to listen to it. Yeah. Right. They're open-minded to listen to other kinds of music because they've heard it in McDonald's. They've heard it on the radio. And they're like, oh, you know, I've talked to people over there who go, well, I'm going to go see, you know, Steve Morse play with Deep Purple tonight. Tomorrow night I'm going to go see the Philharmonic. And then the next night I'm going to go see Seamus Blake. You know, they're so open-minded. They're just like, wow. You know, they'll go hear whatever it is if it's good. And it's a shame that it's just not like that here. No. It's well, not different. You know, you know, I mean, but I, I agree with Scott. But at the same time, it's not just necessarily developing a taste. I mean, I've gone in and heard lots of music I don't understand and still loved it and related to it on yeah, numerous I levels. Agree. You don't have to. You, know, I mean, you might love it first listen. Yeah. yeah. Right. You know, I mean, like, exactly. You know, I mean, whether but it was. But appreciate it on that level right. where you kind of. You may not appreciate it on the level. We understand it at, until you've gone up, you know, t stepped in our steps for a while. Yeah. But of course you can appreciate right. it you know, right from I, the beginning. And I think that, the, I think that, you know, it's really about just exposure. You know, it, it's just sure. like you play great, you know, music, you create an environment. I mean, music, music is more than chords and rhythms and notes. Mm -hmm. It's an energy it's a feeling it's a it's a sound mm. and you know you go in and you hear something you've never heard before you can't understand what the hell it is but it's like amazing and it brings feelings out in you it makes you want to understand what it is or it makes you not want to understand it is because you don't want to ruin the mystery yeah. of it just like a woman i can't tell you how <laughs> okay you can't understand but that's that's another <laughs> no, thing you'll you know never what? figure that i can't out. i can't tell you how many women at gigs have come up to me and said, my boyfriend dragged me here, <laughs> but I really liked your music and I want to buy a CD. Right. And I'm like, wow, okay. But if but you if can't tell us been, how many because it never but, happened. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. But if it hadn't been for the boyfriend dragging her there, she would have never been there in a million years. Right, That's right. my point. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? That she would never be there on her own if it wasn't somebody who knew something about that music dragging her there. She wasn't going to hear about it on the radio. That's for sure. Yeah. 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 And that's my beef is that how come all these other guys get all the radio play and we get none? Zero. You know, I'm all for Kenny G. I love Kenny G. He can be whatever he wants to come be. Come on. <laughs> come on. I'm calling bullshit. We don't have yeah. to lie oh, here, man. Really? You come love on. Kenny no, G. Just saying, how come? You know what I mean? I'm just saying the world's a big place and there's plenty of room for everybody. So Kenny G can have his radio time. Why can't we have ours? Yeah. That's all I'm saying. You know what I mean? Why, why, don't, why can't I turn on my radio and hear Weather Report or Schofield or Coltrane? Or Bruce, or Tribal Tech, you know. Why do I have to only hear, 
DMZ or what the fuck? <laughs> is that such a thing? Or is that no? It's WTF. WTF. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what the fuck ever? Which I always thought was a wrestling <laughs> league. But, I actually know. like some rap, but I mean, you know, I mean, why? You know, I'm just. But isn't it? The fuck? If you go back to it, isn't it like the 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 guys in the band play the music, the women come. The women love it, and the women bring all the the, the, the guys. So yeah, it's like I guess that's true, right? I mean, the reason why yeah. the Beatles were so big because all the screaming girls, and then all the guys come. Like, if you're not bringing women to your show, Joe Zawinul used to say that. Yeah, right? oh, I'm, I'm totally yeah, down. Joe Zawinul said, mean, if you don't bring women to your show, you're not going anywhere. You know, I just I guess I need a bigger car. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you need like a Chippendales I'm gonna, I'm gonna, dancer. I'm gonna get. A, I'm gonna get a bus. I think. <laughs> I think Chippendales dancers is the answer, man. Man, Just... you know, I know, I know, but they they, they rush, you know. <laughs> they, they don't have a good time. Yeah. That's, that's fair. But yeah, it's it's. Eddie, you guys did. You, you play a music that society, especially in America, don't. Well, I, I just want to be clear. I play this music because I hate crowds. <laughs> yeah, and I play it because I hate women. Yeah. <laughs> and hence why I've been playing the pop rock world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, Troy, here, Troy here is playing for like a million people, you know what I mean? And <laughs> our, our pet Australian, you know, is, is out there, you know. He's, yeah, you know man, my he's, street cred compared to you guys is really lacking. I've started off playing in America with... Two Russian lesbians. <laughs> already his creds. It's already than sounds ours. better than it's, me. It's better, but they, they couldn't Are really they... sing technically. And they Who just, cares? It was great. But yeah, that was my thing. And well, how did you know they were lesbians? Well, they, did they, I, that I, must I have been part of the act, fake, right? They were actually fake Russian lesbians. They were even <laughs> real lesbians. So that was. But I got to see the world play for massive audiences, and it didn't matter that they weren't really good. Yeah, they, they weren't. And it didn't matter that they couldn't really perform on stage. I, Lesbianism? No, well, they couldn't perform anything on oh, stage. Okay, they just okay. looked good. I really? saw a sound man of ours that used to do sound for Tribal Tech all for many, many years, and he's a great sound man. And I recently saw him in Europe, and right. he did sound man for my band as well. And and, um, and I said, man, Jack, I haven't seen you for such a long time. What have you been doing? He says, man, I'm doing this awful pop gig it's this chick italian chick you know singer she's gorgeous you know but the music is really kind of lame and i'm i'm it's just you know i really miss hearing good music and i said but how are you man and he says i am so happy <laughs> <laughs> Because he's making money. Because he's surrounded by beautiful women all the time and he's making all kinds of money. He's as happy as can be. Right. There you go. <laughs> but he wanted me to know he missed our music. Yeah, right, right, right. right. <laughs> That's the only thing he missed. Right. right. I wonder if they give him as hard a time as we do. <laughs> We'd just like to take this short break to say thank you. Thank you. Guitar Wank Podcasts with Bruce Foreman, Scott Henderson, and the other guy. I guess I'm getting older and crankier, but I figure if people do what they do with integrity and honesty, that's okay. Right. You know, I mean, that's really all of us. I mean... God, don't ask me what I think of my plan on a given day. Really, what I can't stand is pretentious fakers. Right. You know, who people who think they're good and they're not, or who re- misrepresent themselves in some bullshit way. That's that's where my tolerance. Somebody's trying their best. You know, like a good punk band. Yeah. You know, none of them can play at all, but they're making some amazing wall of sound, and they're putting their heart and soul into it, and they're they're literally bleeding on stage. <laughs> you know, I mean, I you know, I can I can write a pass on that. Yeah. Right. You know what I mean? Oh, I mean totally, and I'm man. not necessarily going to buy it or no, go but, out of my way to listen to it, honest. but I'm go, I'm going to like no, I'm going to say hell yeah, yeah it's hell honest. Yeah. That's and doing what I they do. I aspire yeah. to that too. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's why I would never tell one of my students who can't play that you know, give up music because you're, you don't come up to my standard of how you should play. The truth is, is that that student has the capability of making 10 times more money than I'll ever dream of. 
right? right. Whether he can play or not, mm -hmm. if he just happens to be in the right place at the right, right. time yeah. and have a good image and or, or not or be ugly as hell and still, you know, these days, you know, <laughs> yeah, won the to ugly dog contest. That's huge, what gets huge more than star. a jazz musician, right? <laughs> you know, so so you know, music is way more art than science. It's a little bit, you know, the more you get into classical music and jazz and more more for lack of a word, scholarly types of music, you know, then, yeah, there's a little bit more science involved. But, you know, a lot of music is just art. And if you do it honestly, I don't have anything against guys like punk rockers. What I have against is the guys who call themselves jazz musicians and then all of a sudden change direction and decide they want to try to make some money and do <laughs> something else. And those sellout motherfuckers don't have any credibility with me. Right. Or, yeah. or guys who think they're jazz musicians... And don't even, of course, this is my, another general, this, we, I should maybe leave this for our other segment, but guys who just don't even have the fucking balls to bring it on a nightly basis. They right. think that just by like wanking, and I don't mean in, in this podcast sort of way, hmm. wanking over a bunch of changes, you know, makes them a jazz musician because they, because they're playing some just bullshit over changes without any heart or balls you know right. what i mean or i mean to me that's like you you don't you can't call it that i i my education came in this great club in san francisco called keystone corner right i heard art blakey miles davis oscar peterson bill evans ross on roland kirk bobby hutcherson freddie hubbard every band you know george benson every band where they and they play there for six nights wow and I was always there, unless I had a gig or a session to play at. And then even then, after that, I was there. So you know how many sets of music I heard in my teens and early 20s. And I'll tell you the truth, not one night, and I heard a lot of good nights and I heard a lot of bad nights too, mm -hmm. but not one second were those guys not bringing it. They were 100% invested in that music to a level of this was their personal statement and they were going to go down with the ship or they were going to go out in a blaze of glory. You know what I mean? Right. Regard, you know, like, right. These were people who that music wasn't just, oh, I feel like I'll pull out my hollow body and play a few licks on the guitar <laughs> on, this, on this night because I got this little gig and the rest of the time I'll go like go fucking watch TV or something. You know, yeah. I mean... That is not jazz, and I'm sorry, you're not a jazz musician. You know, I don't even care if you play good. <laughs> I, I got That's it. where my cutoff is. Right. I, I got to tell you, my my feeling is that schools are highly responsible for the lack of emotion in a lot of jazz players these days. That's right. what I believe mm -hmm. because they're teaching them the wrong shit. You know, and I could go on and on and on because I'm a teacher. And I, 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 I'm not bragging, but the truth is, is I teach them the right shit. Right. You know, I teach them how to play with emotion and feeling and try to tell a story with their music, not just a bunch of scientific bullshit like scales and arpeggios, because that's not music. Those are tools mm. and tools are nothing without the heart, you know, and the emotion that comes from playing music. And there's a lot of people that play music that just play with no feeling or an emotion. They just don't know how because yeah. no one ever told them that's what it's about. Or they don't, they didn't, somehow they just didn't pick that up in their knowledge, in their quest to learn music. They never figured out what it's really about, that it's probably better just to throw your guitar on the floor and make a bunch of noise if it has some emotion in it than to play the shit they play. Right. You know, and that's why usually when someone asks me about a bad guitar player or, you know, somebody that I hate his playing because he plays with no emotion, my response is usually I'd rather hear Stevie Ray Vaughan drop his guitar on the floor than to hear this guy or that guy because they play with no emotion whatsoever. Yeah. I'm yeah. not going to mention names, yeah, but no, you know no, what no, I'm no, saying. Stop there. Well, let's say they that know who later. they are, guys. People, 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 will come, people will come back if they expect you're going to do it later. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. Next, next week is the list. <laughs> But there's, there's, like you said, <laughs> Stevie Ray, like, that guy just oozed emotion. The guy fucking just... played his ass off. Yeah, he did. There's no guys, doubt about it. Did you get it. the same live? Huh? Did you get the same play? Yes, live? I saw him live three times. Wow. Yeah. Just saw him. Great, man. Yeah. You know, the, 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 in, in a way, I, one of the things that I really regret is that I never got to see Hendrix live. Right. And 
there was a, <clears throat> some moments in one of Stevie Ray's tunes where, where I felt like he was channeling Hendrix to the point where I felt like I'd seen Hendrix live. Right. You know, because it was just really, he was so on in this one particular tune that really called for that style of playing, yep. a kind of just all balls out playing for it, which is not really his style, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? But he really did get really close to Hendrix as far as the spirit of what was going on and some of the things he was playing and the way he was playing them. Right. It was really but, heavy. Yeah, but that spirit is no different than Charlie yeah. Parker, no different than John Coltrane, yeah. no, different yeah, than, no different than than Art Tatum, right. no different right. than... Then you know what I mean. If you look at all the great, you know, listen to Pablo Casals. Listen to you know. I mean, you just listen to great music, and these people are reaching way beyond notes and rhythms yeah. and sounds. Yeah. It's the human part that 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 makes it, and and we all have to really have to gut check why we're doing this and what we're doing it for in order to bring any of that essential element. And I, I couldn't agree more with Scott. I think particularly in jazz education, it's become an analytical thing where people figured out what people have done before, analyze it, and just like it's like showing somebody a car by, by putting all the parts of a car on the floor. Right. See, that's a car. You see, there's a, there's a wheel and there's a screw over there and there's a little something over there. You know what I mean? And... No, it's not. It's the human. Yes, those those elements are inside it. But right. to, to assume that that is what makes it tick mm -hmm. is completely missing the point. Yeah. It's the hard on you get when you drive it. Right. Exactly. <laughs> it's like not, exactly. That's what that's what it's about. And and, and you it's like you know, there's nothing else. And and as soon yeah. as we divorce that element from the details of it, we are doing a disservice. To it, but but why do we do it? It's the only shit we can teach. You, I can't teach you to feel something. I mean, I can kick you in the balls and you're going to hurt for a while. I guess I can teach you to feel pain by that. But I mean, to teach you to really communicate that, right? I can't do that. No, man. you can. You can. I can demand that you do it, but I, yeah. I and I can show you how I do it, yeah. and I can show you how others have done it. But you have to bring that yourself. You have yeah, to be yeah. willing because you know what. Being a, particularly a jazz musician is a lesson in humiliation because every day I am putting everything I've got out on the line and every phrase and every song and every approach to every tune and listening to everybody and interacting with them and I'm always at the edge of screwing up or screwing up. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing it in front of people, not just an audience, but more importantly, the people I play with who really know right. when I fall down. Mm -hmm. And I've got to be willing to fall down at any moment because, first of all, the real music happens then. But second of all, even if I do fall down, that's where the real learning to get better and to find the real truth in the music lies is in the experience of trying and failing and trying again and mm -hmm. trying mm -hmm. again and trying again and living with the fact that, yeah, I know I can play okay. And I know that sometimes I really hit some shit. Yeah. But the most of the time I just suck. <laughs> yeah. And and to be able yeah. to live in that world right. and yeah. still create and still want to go forward. That is what we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Wikipedia this week, Bruce. Who are you bringing to the table? Well, I'd like to bring a, another friend of mine, a guy named Jake Langley. Mm -hmm. He's a great uh, jazz guitar player. Also plays Western swing and plays a lot of rock and roll. He's uh, he was in Joey DeFrancesco's band for a long time. Kind of bounced around. He was in Austin for a while, and now he's in Las Vegas, where he plays with. I think he's got the Cirque du Soleil game which is, of course, very verse. That's a lot of stuff to do. Yeah. And it just shows his versatility. He also plays in an organ trio with the Ronnie Foster, who was George Benson's keyboard player back in the day. Wow. Back in the, yeah. literally, in right around when uh, the Breezen record came out. Uh, Jake's a great player, so I think everybody should check him out. Jake? Langley, L-A-N-G-L-E-Y. 
And that will be it for today's show. Scott, say goodbye, mate. Goodbye, man. <laughs> Bruce, thanks. <laughs> say goodbye. Osmosis, Aviva. <laughs>